Howdy, y'all. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, that's a good question. I've thought about it a lot, and I'm sure you guys have too. You'd like to know. You'd like to know how you ranked. You'd like to get a report card from Jesus. Tell you where you stood. If you were going to graduate or not. Right where you was. If you're making straight S, you could turn it around. Do your homework better. Till you get that passing grade. And this guy, this ruler, he comes to Jesus in a verse that Michael read here in Luke chapter 18, verse 18. The certain ruler asked him, he said, Good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What do I got to do? How do I get there? And Jesus started him out in a certain direction there. And I used to wonder when I was seven or eight years old, I used to wonder what he meant by that. But Jesus says here in verse 19, Jesus says, Why do you call me good? Why do you call me good? And I used to think about that. I used to think, man, why would Jesus say that? Because Jesus is good, right? He's good all the way. He says, why do you call me good? None is good except one, and that is, that is God. And really all goodness flows from God. That's where it all comes. That's the reason Jesus is so good, because he's God. And he wanted to know. And it says here in verse 18 that he was a ruler. And Jesus talked to him there, and as you read on down to verse 23, it says, And when he heard this, and we'll talk about it in a minute, the story. He said, But when he heard this, he was sorrowful, for he was very rich. So he was a ruler, and he was rich. I like that, rich. A lot of you are sitting out there in church today, and you're rich. Rich people. A lot of people I work with are rich people. I've got some friends that are rich people. And I always like rich people. Because you can always ask a rich person. You can always say, are you rich? And what will the rich person say? No, no, I'm no, no, no. I like that. And since they lie about it, I started lying myself. You ask me about it, I'll tell you, I say, I'm rich. I'm loaded. I've got all kind of money. I told a guy that in a parts store the other day. I said, give me that good battery. I want that good battery. He said, I said, is that battery any good? He said, I don't know. I can't afford it. I said, I can. I said, I got all kind of money. He said, I got all kind. I'm, I'm rich. So that's my thing now. I'm just going around and tell everybody I'm rich. He was rich and he was a ruler. Now, I want you to, to turn back with me to the book of Matthew. In the book of Matthew chapter 19, and it tells the same story in the book of Matthew chapter 19, and in verse 22, it says, But when the man heard the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. When, but Matthew chapter 19, verse 22, But when the young man heard that saying, he went away because he had many possessions. So he was a ruler... He was rich, and he was young. Man, he had it all. I was looking for a verse in the Bible, but you can just assume. I was looking for a verse in the Bible that said he was good looking, too. <laughs> I mean, he had everything. He was rich, and he was young, and he was a ruler. That's what we got, rich, young, ruler. As a matter of fact, that's what they, they call him a lot of times. People, when they're discussing, they say, you know, the rich, young ruler, the rich, young ruler, Rich, young, ruler. Also in the book of Mark chapter 10. Let's turn to the book of Mark chapter 10. The book of Mark chapter 10, that's where Mark tells the story at. In the book of Mark chapter 10, and in verse 17, he says something about this guy here. It says, and when he was gone forth into the way, Mark chapter 10, verse 17, and when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And so he's running. So Mark gives us another clue. If we didn't have Matthew, we got Mark telling us about him running and then kneeling down before the Lord. So the guy's young. He's rich 
and he's a ruler. What must I do to be saved? And as we look here in the book of Mark, chapter 10, verse 17 there that we read, what do I do have to do to inherit life? And in verse 18, Jesus said unto him, Why do you call me good? There's none good. Just God. He says, You know, verse 19, You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not. Defraud not. I had to, I had to look that up. Defraud not. Do you know what defraud means? Defraud not. It means don't take something that isn't rightfully yours. We could change that a little bit and say, Thou shalt not covet. It ain't yours. Don't want something that's not yours. And so he says here, he says, You know the commandments. Don't commit adultery. Don't kill. Don't steal. Don't lie. Don't covet. And honor your mother and father. Where in the world did Jesus get that stuff? From Exodus chapter 20. What we call the Ten Commandments, right? You with me? Those are in there? Y'all are a sleepy bunch today. Those are in there. Matter of fact, they're the last six. They're the last six. Now, this is interesting because I want you to hold your place there and go back again with me to, to, to Matthew chapter 19 because Jesus puts it this way, or Matthew puts it this way in his book. And in, in, in Matthew chapter 19, verse 18, it says, He asked what I must do to be saved, and he said, Keep the commandments, and he says, Which one? And Jesus said in verse 18, Matthew chapter 19, verse 18, Thou shalt do no murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. And thou shalt not bear false witness. And then in verse 19 he says, Honor your father and your mother. But he says something very interesting here at the end of verse 19. He says, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now where did that one come from? So he tells this guy, he says, all these things that you do, he says, you honor your mother and father, you don't lie, you don't kill, you don't commit adultery, you don't steal, you don't covet. Love your neighbor as yourself. I want you to turn forward with me to Matthew chapter 22, just a couple pages. And in Matthew chapter 22, verse 36, Jesus makes a statement here. Matthew chapter 22, verse 36, one came to him and he said, Master... Which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said unto him, Love the Lord thy God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now those are the exact words that Matthew said in Matthew chapter 20 verse 19. And he said, he named all the six commandments and said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And Jesus says, there's really only two laws. Love God more than anything in this world and love your neighbor as yourself. And so when Matthew requotes those six commandments, he says, love your neighbor as yourself. So when God says, there's two commandments really. Love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And the other one is to love your neighbor as yourself. That's the reason the Ten Commandments are in two, two stones. It wasn't because God was rotten and he ran out of room. <laughs> I'm smart enough to get a big enough piece of paper to write on. It's because there's two. One is how you love God, and one is how you love man. See? And a lot of people, they read that verse and say, Aha! The only thing we have to do is love God with all our heart and love our neighbor as ourself. But see, even Jesus knew that in the book of Matthew. He says, yes, you love your neighbor as yourself. That's how you summarize it. You love your neighbor as yourself by honoring your mother and father, not killing, not committing adultery, not stealing, not lying, and not coveting. That's how you love your neighbor. Now, how you love God is the first four. Have no other gods before me. And don't make any graven images or bow down and put no idols before me. And you love my name. The sweetest, they say the sweetest name that anyone can hear is their own. <laughs> That's like us too, isn't it? You like that? Quentin. Cynthia. Huh? 
It gets your attention, don't it, John? Huh? It really gets my attention because I got sort of a weird name, you know. And then the fourth one. If you love me, if you love me, you're going to have a, we're going to meet together. And we're going to have a special time. We're going to meet together every week. As a matter of fact, I created the world in six days. And on the seventh day, I rested to just celebrate that I am the creator of heaven and earth. And for all of history, I want us all to continue meeting on that day so we won't forget that I am the creator. And in six days, I created the earth. Because if you stop keeping the Sabbath, you might even have people in the world that don't believe in God. That could happen if people didn't keep the Sabbath. That could happen, not in this world, but in some other fictitious world that could happen. And so this rich young ruler, he comes to him and he says, and I want you to go back with me now to the book of Mark chapter 10. He says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And here in Mark chapter 10, as we were reading, in verse 20, the rich young ruler said, Master, all of these I have observed from my youth. Now, you know what that means. He was a good guy. He wasn't going to lie to Jesus. I mean, he was telling the truth. I've kept all of this from my youth. I haven't been a liar. I mean, he's a ruler. He's rich. He got a good job. Probably, probably a good guy. I haven't been a liar. I hadn't been stealing from people. I've never murdered anyone. My favorite job interview question, have you ever killed anyone? I have never murdered anyone. I don't want what other people's got. I'm not envious of them. I've kept all of these my whole life. What are you talking about, Willis? And that's the reason that Jesus named those. Because Jesus knew that he was keeping those. He said, well, you need to do this and this and this and this. Well, I've done that. Check, 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 check. <laughs> and then Jesus says, there's one thing that you lack. There's one thing there that where you come up short. And remember, he keeps the love thy neighbor as thyself. An atheist can do that. He says there in verse 21, And then Jesus beholding him, loved him. He loved him. He wanted that guy. He liked this guy. What, you know, that's the reason they picked the Apostle Paul. A lot of potential there. It always upsets me because when you read through the Bible, nowhere is Jesus walking alone or any prophet walking alone. And they say they, they ran into a lazy man doing nothing. And he says, hey, will you help me spread the gospel? They never go into a lazy guy. There's never a story of a lazy guy becoming a great preacher or pastor or prophet. That hurts my feelings, right? That sort of rules me out. <laughs> <laughs> he never goes to a lazy bum and says, we, it's always somebody working or busy or somebody who's productive, somebody who does that kinds of thing. They got this potential. And Jesus loved this guy. When he looked at him, he, he loved him. And he said, but there's one thing that you lack. Go and sell whatsoever you have and give it to the poor and you shall have treasure in heaven and come take up the cross and follow me. And I used to read that for most of my life. I read that and I thought, uh-huh. Jesus don't want nobody to have nothing. It's a sin to have a bunch of money. It's a sin to have a nice home. And it's a sin to have a nice car. And it's, a, it's wrong. And, and Je it, it, Jesus don't want nobody to have none of those things. But then you look at Job. And then you look at Abraham. Then you look at even, even Daniel. All these people, King Solomon, King David, all of these people, it's not that. It's not that Jesus doesn't want you to have anything. On the contrary, Jesus wants you to be blessed. 
But the problem was, this guy's stuff was in his way of his relationship with God. And Jesus knew that, that if him and this boy were going to connect, that that stuff had to be moved out of the way. That was his problem. It was keeping him from knowing God on a personal level. And Jesus said, you're going to have to get rid of that stuff and follow me. You're going to have to put that on the back burner and follow me. And then the Bible says here in Mark chapter 10, verse 22, it says, And he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. Wow! He went away. He, took, he measured that. He looked at that. He says, Jesus, all my stuff. Jesus, all my stuff. Sorry, Charlie. That's sad. I bet he was sad. Wow. He gave up eternal life for his stuff that he had here. Now that's sad. And we'll come back to that story. But I want to read, there's a happy story about the rich young ruler. Did you know that? There's a happy story about the rich young ruler. I want to read to you about the other rich young ruler, and I want you to turn with me to the book of Luke, book of Luke chapter 19. And this is the happy story about the rich young ruler. And here in Luke chapter 19, beginning with verse 1, the Bible says, Luke chapter 19, verse 1, And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. What was the rich young ruler's name? What was the, rich, the first one? What was his name? His name was Rich Young Ruler, wasn't it? <laughs> right? right off the bat now, we've got a Zacchaeus. Booyah! His name was Zacchaeus, it said, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. He was rich. So here we got a guy that's rich. And you say, yeah, Quentin, it says he was rich, okay? But he also says that he was chief among the publicans. Do you know what that means? And I went, I actually spent time researching this this week because I wanted to make sure that I was right. And the research that I did, it agreed with me, so I knew they were right. And so it says chief, chief of the tax collectors or the publicans. You know what it means? It means he was the boss. He was the ruler. <laughs> He was the ruler. He was the tax commissioner. He was the ruler of them. So he was a ruler, and he was rich. Are you with me? You say, Quentin, yes, he was a ruler. And yes, Quentin, I get it that he was rich. So yeah, that, 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 that makes sense. But, but nowhere does it say that he was young. Ah. Verse 3. It says, and he sought to see Jesus, who he was. And I want to come back to that. And he could not for the press because he was little of stature. Verse 4. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. Aha! Guy, when's the last time you took off running wide open and jumped up in a tree and climbed it? Any of you, when's the last time you took off running and jumped up in a tree and climbed it? <laughs> you know why? Because we're not young. <laughs> Many decades ago, when we were young. And so if this guy's running across, he jumps up in a tree and climbs to the top of the tree, my friends, he's a young man. He's not old. And so here we have a rich, young ruler that comes to Jesus the same way. He's wanting to know. The Bible says here in verse 3, it says, he, and he sought to see Jesus who he was. And he couldn't because of the press of the crowd, because he was little of stature. He wanted to know who he was. He wanted to know Jesus. He wanted to know him. Now, I've had a strange thing. I don't know if this is common or not. 
Perhaps it is. I don't know. But I have had a strange thing happen to me in my lifetime on four different occasions. And I'm going to tell you three of them. This one time, I was 13, 14 years old. And I had this friend. And we started hanging out, and we become real good friends. And one night, I was... We were spending the night at his house or my house or someone's house. I don't know. But it got real quiet in the night, and we were talking. And his voice cracked up a little bit. He was crying. And he says, he says, man, I need to tell you something. And I says, what is it? He says, I always hated you. I said, you hated me? He said, I hated you. I said, you hate me? He said, no, I love you now. He said, but I've always hated you. He said, I always hated you. I said, really, you hated me, man? He said, yeah, I hated you. And I said, and he told me this little story. I'm going to tell you a story because it comes full circle. He told me this little story. He says, well, when I was a kid, I may not have, I, I may not can do nothing, okay? I've never been good at nothing in my life. But I was good at one thing when I was a kid is I could ride a bicycle. And I went all over the country riding a bicycle. And we had this BMX team, had a little sponsorship and everything. And he told me this story. He said, I always hated you. He said, you know this one time? And it was, it was when I, first time ever, we had a mutual friend, and we went riding bicycles together. And we came up with this big flight of steps. He said, you know, if you had come fast and jumped off the top of those steps, he said, that, I, that would have burnt me up because he said it was a high flight of steps. He says, but you went down the road and come flying up at the steps and jumped up on top of the steps backwards. And he says, when you did that, I said, man, that was cool. He said, when you did that, he said, he said honestly, he said, I wanted to kill you. I hated you. And I said, man, you didn't know me. He said, I know. He said, I, had, I didn't know you, Quentin. He said, that's the reason it tears me up so bad, because I didn't know you, man. You are nothing like what I thought. I didn't know you. Now, the reason I told you this little story, because it goes full circle. <clears throat> so we rode together for several years, and he got really good at riding, too. As good as me, probably. And we were in this big crowd, people around, everything was doing stuff, and Des watching, and he had this little trick. We called it a zag nut. And he'd been working on it for a long time. And it's where simply you run off a cliff or a bluff or a sidewalk, and you just do a 360 in the air and land and keep riding. And he'd been practicing, but he couldn't pull it off good. He could probably do it maybe 10% of the time. But we were there in front of all these people, other kids and everything, and he gets this crazy idea, and I see him lining up for it, and I know what he's going to do. I'm like, man, you're nuts. So he takes flying off, and man, he, it's the best one I've ever seen in my life. He flies up in the air. He's like an angel swooping around. It lands it, and he rides off. He's cool as Elvis Presley. And so later that night, we're alone. We're at, I was sitting on our box, and we're talking. And I said, man, I said, that was cool. He said, I know. Can you believe I pulled that off? I said, I know it, man. I said, that was awesome. He said, what did you think about that? I said, when you did that, I thought, I'm going to kill him. <laughs> and we laughed. We laughed. Then, several years later, <clears throat> graduated high school, and there's a friend, a guy that I went to school with all my life. Started hanging out with him. We went to Nashville one night, did some, some stuff, and we were coming back late that night going down the interstate, and it got quiet. And he says, Quentin, I got a confession to make. And I said, what is it, man? He said, second time it's happened to me, same thing. He said, I always hated you. And I said, you hated me? He said, man, I hated you. I could not stand you. I said, really? He said, yeah, I hated you my whole life. I hated you. All through school, I hated you. I said, man, what'd you hate me for? And he says, I didn't know you. 
I didn't know you. I didn't know what kind of person you were. I didn't know you. I thought I knew you, but I didn't really know you. I hated you. I said, you love me now, though, don't you? <laughs> and then the last time this happened to me, I was in my 40s. And I was at work. And this other guy, he was in his early 60s. And we'd worked together for a long time. But we had this one project that was a big mess and everything. And I said, I'm going to stay committed to it and, and go out here and work with this guy and, and stuff. And, of course, I, I, I didn't have any, you know, I, I'll be honest with you, I love everybody. So I went and worked with him. We worked together for a long time, back and forth and stuff and everything. We worked through it, got it all straightened out and stuff. And it was several days later, I was in my office and he came in and he sat down. And he says, I want to tell you something. And when somebody tells you this, it hurts your feelings a little. He said, I want to tell you something. I said, yeah, man, what is it? He says, I've always hated you. Has this happened to you guys? Really? It's happened to me four times in my life, but I'm not going to leave one of them out for no particular reason. He says, I always hated you. And I said, really? What do you hate me for? And he's just, you know, just, you know stuff and everything. And I said, man, wh why do you hate me? He said, Quentin, I didn't know you. He said, I didn't know how you really was. I didn't know you. I didn't know you. And so after that day, you know, we was like besties and everything. He, he, he loved me. His whole, everything changed. And, and he retired some time ago, but he still calls me every now and then. And sometimes he comes in the bank and asks Amanda about me and stuff. You know, I love him to death. He loves me to death, too. But there's three times that happened to me in my lifetime like that, sort of hurt my feelings. But the thing is, they didn't know me. They didn't know who I was. They thought they knew me. They thought they knew what I was about. They took one look at me and decided, but they didn't know me. They didn't know who I was. I remember a few years ago, John says, there's this lady in the hospital. She's sick. And he says, I, I want to go visit her and uh, pray for her and talk to her. And so we go to the hospital. I think you don't remember. We go to the hospital and we go in there and we're talking to her. And John says, well, this is my this is my, my preacher. And she rose up in bed and she says, you don't look like a preacher. <laughs> but they didn't know me, see? They didn't know me. And you know, an, an atheist, they don't know Jesus. That's the problem. If you don't like Jesus, it's because you don't know him. If you don't love Jesus, it's because you don't know him. You don't know Him. You can't know Jesus and not love Jesus. If you know Him, you'll love Him. And Zacchaeus, he come to that tree and he wanted to know Jesus. He knew who Jesus was. He knew what Jesus looked like. He knew where Jesus come from. He knew what Jesus was doing. But that wasn't enough because he didn't know Jesus. He didn't know Him. And Amanda, my wife, she's the worst. She always talking about people. You know, she'll tell me a whole story about somebody. And she'll say, well, you know, the other day, uh, Don, he, he wrecked his truck. And, and, and Carol, she came by and she was drunk. You know how Sally always is. And, and Jim Bob, he said, and I was sitting there thinking, who are these people? Right? I don't know. I don't know all these people. She calls everybody by their names, right? And I just, I just don't do that. You know, I'm talking about somebody you don't know. I say this guy at work or this somebody, you know, or this, you know, the guy that had the accident the other day or whatever. She's naming all, all these people. I'm like, you know, I can't put it together. I don't know Jim Bob and Sally Sue and all these people. And that's the way it is. The whole world talking about Jesus, but they don't know him. They don't really know him. And Zacchaeus, he wanted to know Jesus. Not just see him, not just know who he was, not just be able to point at him and say, yes, that's Jesus of Nazareth. That's not good enough. You know, a lot of times somebody say, do you know somebody? And I'll say, I know who he is. That means I don't really know him. And most of the world, they know who Jesus is, but they don't know him. 
And Zacchaeus came and he wanted to know Jesus. He wanted to know who he was. It says in verse 5, And Jesus came to the place, and he looked up, and he saw him, and he says, Zacchaeus, come down from there, because I'm going to abide at your house. And he made haste, and he came down, and he received him joyfully. And when they saw it, then they mumbled, and they said, Oh, look here, he's going to be a guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood... Check this out, verse 8. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore it to him fourfold. Now where was the part where Jesus looked at Zacchaeus and he said, Hey, if you really want to follow me, you need to give up all of your stuff and sell it to the poor and come and follow me. Where was that part at in that story? It wasn't there. Because Zacchaeus was in love with God. Zacchaeus was in love with Jesus. And he wanted to know Jesus. It wasn't, that wasn't even it. Sure he'd give all that up. Give all that up in a second for Jesus. Because he loved Jesus. There's a difference in knowing Jesus and knowing Jesus. In most of the world, we think, and all these people out here, they think they know Jesus, but they don't know Him. We've even got Christians and people sitting in the church, and they don't really know Jesus. And if you don't really know Him, you know, when Sabrina, when Sabrina prays a lot of times, she says, Daddy, <laughs> I like that. <laughs> That's more personal, right? That's more personal. If you don't really know him. I heard this preacher preaching a week or so ago. And he told this story about his brother. And I like this story. He said his brother, one time, him and his brother, when they were kids, they went to a camp meeting. And it's like God's children's story this morning. They went to a camp meeting. In the, in the camp meeting, they were singing songs and playing music. And so... As a child, his brother got into his head, and man, this, this story can relate to a lot of people. He's, he's, he got into his head, he says, I'm going to learn to play the guitar. How many of you, show of hands, have decided at one time or another to learn how to play a musical instrument? <laughs> this, this story really hits home with most of us. He says, I'm going to learn how to play the guitar. And so... They left camp meeting, and he went, and they bought him a guitar for $25. And so he started trying to play the guitar, and of course he couldn't make heads or tails or anything of it. And he went and bought a little book. And he looked in the book, and he learned some chords. Just a few chords he learned. And he found out that with those few chords, he could play songs by just by knowing, not really knowing how to play the guitar, but he knew just a few chords, and with those few chords, he could play a song. And so then he started singing a little bit and playing a few songs. And he would play those songs, and, and he would sing, and he knew those four chords, and he always really wanted to learn how to play the guitar, but, you know, time and stuff. And so they got older, and he went off to college. And he says, you know, in college, I'll have some time. And he says, I will learn how to play the guitar. So he took his guitar off to college with him. And a guy come by, one of his buddies came by, and the guitar was sitting in the corner in the dormitory. And his buddy says, hey, man, is that your guitar? And he says, yeah. And so he says, can I play it? Do you mind? He says, no, go ahead. So he picked it up, and he says, man, he just played that guitar and just, just rocked it out, man. It, there, there was stuff coming from the guitar and sounds that he had never even heard before. He was just wearing it out, man. He says, man, I like that guitar. And he says, do you mind if I borrow it? And he says, well, sure, I, go ahead. And he borrowed it like the first week in college. And he didn't see that guitar for four years. He said it, that guy went all over the place playing that guitar everywhere and singing. He said they'd be walking through campus and there'd be a crowd of people around him. He'd be playing that guitar and singing. And he would be with his girlfriend. She'd say, wow, isn't that guy neat? And he said, yeah, that's my guitar up there. <laughs> so after four years, they... Graduated college, and his buddy handed his guitar back to him. 
I always wanted to play the guitar. And so after that, he, he joined up with a church after college and started going. And there was a young lady there who wanted to learn how to play the guitar. So he gave that guitar to her. He wanted to play the guitar, but <clears throat> just never really did. And so after that, he got a job at Andrews University. Started teaching there. And while I was there at Andrews University, he met this guy that could play guitar amazing. And not only could he play guitar amazing, but he also gave lessons. He says, man, I've always wanted to learn how to play guitar. He said, would you teach me? He said, yeah, I'll teach you. No problem. Yeah, sure. So he went out, bought him another guitar, bought him a book, got his stuff, practiced up on his couple chords, went to the lessons. The guy gave him some lessons to do, some practice exercises. He said, now you go home, you practice those, you learn those chords and everything. He says, you come back next week and we'll progress. So he went home the first week and he didn't get around to practicing. So he came back and they didn't, they couldn't progress. They couldn't go anything. He says, but you know what? He says, I'll practice next week though. He says, I'll, I'll, I'll practice next week. Laid out some stuff for him to practice on. Looked, went over some stuff and went home. Didn't really have time to get around to it. So he went back to the lessons the next week. They're getting ready to practice. The guy says, man, did you, did you practice? He says, no, I really didn't have time to get to it. He says, look. He says, I'm, you're just wasting my time and I'm wasting yours. He said, just call me when you can practice. So he went on back home and, and put, his, put his guitar up. And he's still to this day, he's, he's an older guy now, still to this day, he never really learned how to play guitar. Because he says, I never really got serious about it. I wanted to play guitar. I liked the idea of playing guitar. I loved it. I was aware of it. But I never would really get serious about it. And that's the way many people are in this world. There's going to be many people that, that on that day that, that, that they'll be lost. In their whole life, they hoped and desired and wanted to be a real Christian and have a real relationship with Jesus Christ. But during the week and through their life, they put work first, money first, appointments first, jobs first, cars first, whatever you can put for family first. Those things always went first and God always went second. They wanted to be a Christian they wanted to know Jesus. They wanted to have that relationship with Jesus. They wanted to be real. All their life they pursued it. It was in the back part of their brain, the back burner. They even come to church. But they never got serious about it. And I heard this story of this analogy that, that I liked because it makes you think. If I had this button this big easy button, red easy button. And you could come up here today and you could push that button. And when you push that button, you would never sin again the rest of your life. Would you jump up and run up here and push that button? Or would you think? All the things in your life, the little things, maybe some of the things that you, that you watch, maybe some of the things that you listen to, maybe some of the things that you say, maybe some of the things that you do. No longer would you be able to do any of those things after pushing that button. Would you push it? Would you push it? You know, some say the gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ. And it says in the book of Matthew that that one day that gospel will cover the entire world and, and Jesus will come. That's the one place that maybe Jesus messed up. He shouldn't have called it the gospel. He shouldn't have called it the good news. He should have called it the gossip and the bad news. It would have already spread the world ten times. <laughs> That's how we are. And so what I'm saying to you today 
is, guys, that's important. I mean, we come here every week and we go to church, and that's awesome. That's extremely important. But when you go home through the week, that's on you and your relationship with Jesus. And you have got to make time to study your Bible. You have got to make time to pray to God every day, many times. You should be focused on Him, and He should be the center of your life. And you need to get serious about the Lord. Because when He comes, the Bible says, when we look in the book of Matthew and Chapter 5, I believe it is, where he's talking. Uh, chapter 7, actually. There's a group of people. They were good people. It says they cast out demons in his name. If you're looking that up, it's Matthew chapter 7. I believe it's verse 22 or 23. When he comes, they said they, they, they did all these great works. But he says, depart from me. I never knew you. That's the reason that you don't know the rich young ruler's name. But we do know the name of Zacchaeus. And Jesus is coming soon. The clouds are rolling back. Graves are going to open. People will levitate into the air and meet Jesus. Those of us that are alive, we will be standing here. It'll be a little scary at first because you're going to be standing here and the people in the graves are going to be raising up. And then we're going to meet them in the air. That's far out. That's far out, guys. That's, that's out there. I believe it. I believe it. Now, when Jesus comes, when he was coming down the road, and he looked up there and seen that guy in the tree, he says, Zacchaeus, come down. We're going home. And when those clouds roll back, if you don't have that personal relationship with Jesus, if you haven't been striving to really know who Jesus is, He's not going to know your name. And you're not going home. And you're not going to abide with Him. Are you with me? That's all I got today. I love you. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Let's sing our closing hymn. <clears throat> Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart, in my heart. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart.